Compest is a private equity firm with about two and a half billion dollars under management. We have two strategies, the, the direct lending and private equity side, control side. Um, we're based in West Palm Beach, Florida. Uh, and generally focused on deals that are a little, little outside the box, things that are a little different. Um, on the lending side, we're split between sponsored and non-sponsored. We have a long tradition of investing in the non-sponsored space. And our roots are as a merchant banker. So our roots are 25 years ago. So we really have a, an appetite for underwriting risk that others um, sort of cast out quickly. So that's um, our latest fund on the credit side is 450. Typically investing 10 to uh, $40 million per transaction, investing in companies with three to 20 million of EBITDA, which we define as lower middle market. Everyone has their, their own definition for middle market, lower middle market. Uh, but that's generally uh, where we invest. So we're here to, with that, we'll kick off the, the um, talk and uh, appreciative of the guys coming together here. I think we've got a good timing, if nothing else, in terms of talking about the, the topic. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with just introductions and, and uh, who we are so you know kind of what parts of the market we're fo each focused on. Uh, and then we'll get into a little overview of the, the, the industry and where we are now uh, before we get into talk about uh, the market and where we're going. So by, again, I told you about Convest. By way of background, I've been in the, the lower middle market, middle market for about 20 years as a lender, starting at Heller in the late 90s. Uh, most of that time has been spent at Convest the last five years. Before that, I was a part of a team that built Dymus Capital, which was part of Cerberus. Uh, we were there for seven years. So uh, things that are a little outside the box, things that are a little hairier, is what, what's more or less defined my lending career and then, and then dealing with them. Uh, so that's where, that's where I, I've been. Uh, Jason, you want your background? Sure. Jason Van Dusen, Gallup Capital. I've been there about six years and I run the cap markets team there. Gallup Capital is an asset manager. Um, we manage now a little over $15 billion of debt. Uh, we play a pretty broad spectrum now. We're probably relevant from five million of EBITDA in certain industries up to 100 million of EBITDA doing some larger market LBOs. You know, we're, we're an asset manager, so we're kind of, you know, I'd say we're in the box. We're trying to do stuff that is more in the fairway. We try to find great credits, and, and some people may argue we, we over lever them, but I think our loss history proves that that's a better way to play it than, than, than chase yield, in, in our opinion. We primarily cover sponsors, so 95% of our deals are sponsors, and where we're playing right now is mostly senior debt and unit tranche. The firm has changed quite a bit, it's 20 years. Um, while we still have, someone brought up SBIC licenses, and. We still have some small junior capital investments. For the most part now in new deals, we are playing senior debt and unit tranche, although we do do large equity co-invest and we take board seats and are active partners with management. But that's Gallup Capital in a nutshell. I'm Bob Long, I'm the president of Star Mountain Capital. Star Mountain has $500 million of assets under management. We focus on the lower middle market, particularly the credit space. For us, lower middle market is three to $15 million of EBITDA. I think I was invited to the panel because prior to joining Star Mountain very recently, I was the CEO of OHA Investment Corp, the BDC sponsored by Oak Hill Advisors. And prior to that, I ran Converses Capital, which was the largest of the listed fund of funds. And I'm Bob Horak. I co-head the debt advisory group at Lincoln International. Um, for those of you who don't know Lincoln, Lincoln is a middle market investment bank. Um, we do a lot of sell side M&A, uh, capital raising, which is where I spend my time, as well as restructuring and valuations. Um, Lincoln's activities are split about two-thirds in, in M&A advisory. Um, we have 16 offices around the world, 400 investment bankers. Um, we cover 15 or 16 industry groups um, through our, our M&A business, and <clears throat> we were the number one seller of uh, businesses for private equity in 2015. Uh, the debt advisory business um, comprises most of the rest of Lincoln's activities. Uh, we have 25 people solely dedicated to uh, doing financings, executing financings. It, it is primarily for sponsors. Um, about half of our debt advisory people are in the U.S. And, and half are outside the U.S. And last year we placed um, over $3 billion of, of capital, um, again, primarily with sponsors in uh, businesses that generally are between 10 and 40 or 50 million of EBITDA, but uh, we'll talk about this, I'm sure, on the panel. 
Uh, more recently, we've we've seen some opportunities in the, the 50 to 100 million dollar EBITDA segment as well. Uh, Kevin Griffin uh, with MGG Capital. Um, just by way of background, started my investing career at American Capital, one of the first public, public traded VDCs out there. Uh, spent times at Fortress and Highbridge helping build those those credit platforms. Launched MGG about 18 months ago. Uh, we're again focused on the lower end of the middle market, which we're defining as 10 to 40 million or so of EBITDA. Doing mostly non-sponsored transactions. Uh, we'll do some sponsored type deals, but uh, for the most part, like a little bit of a Harrier story, a little bit off the run type credit. Uh, we look to invest anywhere from from 10 to 75 million dollars in any one credit. Uh, fairly industry agnostic. Have not played in the energy and oil space, uh, although that might be coming more in vogue because that's obviously a Harrier space. Uh, but in general, we're, we're agnostic across industries and, and platforms, typically in more in the senior secure part of the capital structure. Uh, I like to be through dollar one, uh, so we'll do most of Unitron, you know, stretching into situations that, you know, maybe require a little bit of senior capital as well as uh, some junior capital. Great. Thank you, guys. So uh, before we get started, I wanted to give a, a quick overview of, of the BDC space and, and some of the, how it's developed so we all sort of have a level set on uh, how we got here, and then we can talk about where we're going and, and, um, and open it up to the panel for thoughts on, on the market today. So the BDC industry has really grown the last 15 years. We sort of, you sort of forget this when you sit today. In 2000, there were about 10 BDCs. You had a period of uh, significant growth through 2007 and 8, uh, where we had about 25. Uh, and then another period of significant growth in 13 and 14. And so what you see here is gone from 10 BDCs to about 40 BDCs uh, public, and a, an asset class that's, that's grown significantly, become a significant part of the sponsor finance market uh, over time. Uh, if th those of you who follow Jonathan Bach, and if you don't, I would suggest you do, he had a really interesting piece yesterday comparing the BDCs to the REITs and MLPs, the development of those markets. And his point was, those markets have grown to levels where we just know them as institutionalized markets today, but at different points in time over the last 30 and 40 years, they went through pain, growing pains the way the BDC is, is going through today. So long term, there should, this, this should be the, this growth should continue, but um, obviously we'll, we'll talk about where we are today. Uh, here we've got asset growth, so again, this really a, <coughs> uh, impressive growth in the space. Uh, this obvious. This includes the leverage that BDCs use. It also includes some of the non-traded BDCs, or includes the non-traded BDCs. And the thing I just point out here is you can see the spike in 13 and 14. Those of us in the market know that that was a particular, that was a tough time uh, from a vintage standpoint in the market. Leverage was high, pricing was low, structures were weak. So that's a tough time to be building a book that that weathers the cycle. Um, as as we think about where the where the uh, where we're going, where we are today, and where we're going. So that's led to some, some struggles. This is the trading patterns over the last five years. You can see that for about the last 18 months, uh, they've been trading, the BDCs as a sector have been trading below 1.0. 1. Uh, and you see the trough in, in uh, January. It's, it's come up off the trough, thankfully. But still trading below one, liquidity is constrained for BDCs that are, that are reliant solely on the public vehicle for their liquidity. And we'll talk a lot more about what that means. But if you look at it by size, the market clearly distinguishes between smaller and larger BDCs. The larger BDCs are generally the market views as, as investing in larger companies, which they view as better credit quality. Um, and they're, they're institutions that have several different pockets of capital, so they have more, the platforms are more substantial. Um, so there's a, clearly a premium. For the smaller BDCs, for many of them, that public vehicle is their primary means of liquidity. So trading at these levels is, is problematic from a liquidity standpoint. And this is really just intended to demonstrate that very few of the BDCs are, are operating above 1.0. So the vast majority of the space with where they're trading today uh, is constrained with liquidity. And so this is just one last look. It just emphasizes the, the periods of growth again. 2002 to 2007, uh, you had 15 IPOs, about 15 more from in 2000. Uh, 11 to 14, and what you can see in 2015, equity raising was at a 10-year low, uh, and if you if you adjust this with the fact that the industry was substantially larger then, it was actually lower than 2002. Uh, 2016 doesn't look a lot better. 
with where they're trading right now. There, there, there could be some activity likely, and there could be some new formation, potentially there's speculation. But it looks like this is going to be a, a, a period of, of consolidation, potentially, and of retrenching uh, for the BDCs. So with that, Bob and Bob Long, I'd like to open it up to you as, as a former manager of a BDC. Just help the group understand what these managers are, are dealing with as they see uh, stocks that are trading at those levels. Sure. Well, I think there, there are a couple of things going on. Uh, as a manager of a small BDC, and before that as a manager of a closed-in fund in Europe, you obviously face the stock buyback question. And, and in both the firms that I ran, we did buy back stock, and at least in one case, very aggressively. But as you pointed out, stock buybacks have pros and cons, and not just for the manager, right? They reduce the smaller BDCs already trade in a, in a more challenged way. So reducing your liquidity by buying back stock, reducing your size, does have a cost to your shareholders that offsets the, the accretion benefits, and not fully offsets, but it's, there is a pro and a con. And as boards approach these decisions, they have to think really carefully about them. I think the, the existential question for BDCs, and I haven't seen John Bach's piece, I, I look forward to seeing that, is are they fundamentally closed-end funds that will suffer from the closed-end fund problem that if you're around BDCs or closed-end funds, generally you hear a lot, perennially traded a discount. And I think the answer to that is yes and no. It is yes if the manager cannot provide access to assets that investors cannot otherwise get. So the most closed-end funds, as we know, are just a package of assets that investors generally have otherwise access to. You slap on a lot of fees. You make them illiquid. illiquid. Of course, they trade at a discount. But for managers who can produce, provide investors access to assets with a risk-reward that is attractive and that they would not otherwise get, then I think the long-term cycle for BDCs is actually very positive. This is I look around the world, lots of negative nominal interest rate securities out there and negative real rate securities for most sovereigns in the world today. So I think the, the thirst for yield continues for a long time and BDCs have a great place to play in that, but only if they can add distinctive value. I'll stop there. Okay, interesting. So from a, so stock buybacks is one, one choice, one alternative. Uh, another is um, improving credit quality. So trying to upgrade the quality of the portfolio, which can mean several things. Uh, for some, it means moving up market, moving away from the lower middle market, moving to more first lien, uh, away from second lien, uh, and just generally keeping the, the credit screen tighter. Uh, I throw it out to the group. Are, are you seeing, um, as, you, as you're in the market and doing deals, are you seeing evidence of that, of, of BDCs uh, changing the credit screen. Well, I'll take a contrarian view and say no, that most of these BDCs have high dividends. They're in trouble, they're trying to keep their dividends going. So they actually chase more yield to get higher rated loans when the market's tight, compounding their credit problems. I mean, that's really what a lot of them are doing. They almost shut down their senior and their second lien and they have to do 12 or 13%. You show them a loan that's pretty good and like, I can only do it if it's at this price. And you know, it's just one deal, but you can just tell their mentality is I'm chasing yield now even more so than I should because I want to keep my dividend going. And so they actually could lead to more trouble in the future, in my opinion, at least on a handful of them. And the smaller the shop, the worse the prop because they might only have 40 loans in a portfolio versus 100 or 200 based on the size of the BDC. Right. And you get a couple of non accrual, then you can trade far below book. And the smaller BDCs have more retail investors who want that tension between net asset value growth and dividend are more focused on dividend. So they're even more subject to the problem that you described, or the tendency you described. Yeah, I mean, we see quite a few of the BDCs in, in our processes, and <clears throat> I would say there's um, there are some, to Jason's point, that, um, that, will, always, <clears throat> that will always chase yield. Uh, they have to in order to deliver the type of return that they've promised to their investors, and, and it is kind of a, a snowballing effect, especially for the, the smaller ones, and I, I think it tends to be the smaller ones that tend to, tend to have more of a, a yield-chasing mentality. I think, you know, then you have firms like Golub and, and Aries and some of the larger groups that, 
have, I think, gravitated more toward first lean and, and unit tranche up the balance sheet, larger, you know, larger companies, higher quality credits. Um, so you, you, have, you have some that are pursuing that strategy. You have some that are always going to be yield hungry. Um, and you have some that I, I think are really just trying to survive. I mean, they're just, they're just treading water right now. And you know, we used to refer to zombie private equity funds uh, that weren't able to raise another fund. And I think a number of these, particularly the, uh, the smaller ones, I would, I would categorize as sort of zombie BDCs that are just recycling what they have um, and, and trying to live another day. I mean, did, Jason, I, you, you bring up a good point. I, I, would, I would agree with kind of your contrarian view, but the cynic, cynic would believe that <coughs> the model is fundamentally broken because if you're not at two scale, I mean, TPG did a good job by getting to scale before they went public. What is the critical mass where a Me Too BDC at $300 million of capital is really never going to survive? Correct, unless they have a lucky credit market and they are able to do, take some risks and it just works out okay. Where do you guys see it as, and maybe, maybe about a good question for you, is is there a critical mass AUM diversity in the portfolio that says this is gonna work versus someone just trying to float a $200 million BDC? Well, I'm not an expert, but I've read these research reports for a couple of years, and yeah. my instincts are, I know when we, and I have to be obviously very thoughtful about what I say, I'm not in that role anymore, but um, I think if you look at these smaller BDCs, all of them have thought about re-IPOing, which affects in one way or the other. My view, uh, and I think the view of others is, don't bother unless you can get to $400 million of expected trading value, that there was a break point there. You're still not gonna get the mutual funds as investors at that size, but you think, I think, I, think uh, I would not recommend taking the reputational hit of a dilutive stock risk, a dilutive capital risk, because that's what's required. That's what these guys are gonna have to do unless you get to size, because you're not gonna have done anything for your investors, and ultimately that's not gonna help. You know, I think another thing people should try to do is not IPO until 50% of their capital is not their BDC. So have a diversified pool of financing sources, whether it's from some CLOs or a private fund or separate accounts, an anchor insurance company, so that even if you IPO and your BDC doesn't trade well, you have diversity of capital. Because you know, Dan hit this, but a lot of public BDCs probably have, I don't know, 70 to 100% of their capital in the BDC. And when they trade below NAV, they're, they're kind of paralyzed. They're li living off your denture. So I know there's a guy from Apollo here, but uh, Patrick Dalton, like four years ago, he was there, said, oh, now you guys have IPO'd, and now what? And, you know, and, and a lot of them are the ones that are probably in that 70 cents and below category of they never got to scale. So everybody was rushing to get public when it was kind of the, the trendy thing to do. And your costs go up, and your admin stuff goes up. And unless you really ramp up your origination, um, you know, if you trade below NAV too quickly, all of a sudden you're really hamstrung. Unless you have other pools of capital to put new deals into. And let's think about that. So imagine you get public, you trade, and then you're going to try to raise a private fund. Why should I invest in your private fund? You're trading below NAV. I like you. I can buy that. So more liquid to be in the right, BCs. Right, and it's a, a dead on discount or they think it's going to be a discount. It's interesting. People people forget in 2009, or just as context, in 2009 the BDC business, business model was declared dead. It was, you know, these are by some. These are going to liquidate. This business model is flawed. It's going to go away. 2010, it literally reversed. They were the only model that had any liquidity and had access to liquidity because private credit investors didn't want illiquidity. It was a dirty word coming out of the financial crisis. So it very quickly came into vogue. You had a lot of people rush and, and, and get public, and now we're now we're dealing with that, figuring out which are going to be the, the survivors. And so I guess that brings up the next point, which is uh, one of the things that 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 spotlight shining on the space has, has brought is shareholder activism. And so you're now he seeing and hearing more examples of. Uh, Big guys, you know, guys that you would not have seen investing in BDCs historically, big investors, and also, but just generally, activism in the boardroom. Uh, just be curious for, for what you guys think. How is this, you know, what's happening and how does this play out? Is it, I'll, I'll open it up. It's a hard question because I don't think we've really seen anything happen as a result of 
the shareholder activism that, that has occurred out there. Um, and, and maybe Bob, this is a, the point that you were making. It, it's, you know, you think about, well, who's gonna, who's gonna buy a BDC? It, I mean, there's no reason for a buyer to come in and, and buy a BDC for one, one times NAV or, or anything above one times NAV when they could buy the shares in the public market for less than one times NAV. And there's no reason for the BDC manager to sell at below one times NAV unless they're absolutely forced to do so. And I just I don't think we've seen the shareholder activism yet be able to force anything anything to happen, so I, I think the got, jury's still out. I mean, to that point, you've got- as, as how that ends. Yeah, you've got the old BDC model with, and it's, it's evolving and changing, but historically, the boards of all these BDCs are set up with friends and family of guys that they're not gonna vote against the chairman, and so the fiduciary responsibility conversation really gets thrown out the window when you're talking about, okay, the board's not gonna vote in favor of selling at a discount because they're basically in cahoots with the CEO of the company. Um, never say that exactly that way, but fundamentally, that's the reason why I don't think you've seen a lot of trading going on, because there hasn't been that catalyst. That's changing, and I think people are getting wise to the model and, and kind of how that works, but I don't know if you guys have seen it differently, but anytime we've made a bid at one, historically, the price is at a far premium to where it's trading, but there's no, there's no, no one's, no one's selling. I mean, as you're, as a manager of BDC, you are reaping a very nice payment stream, and for you to sell it, it's gotta be, to your point, close to par, if not, premium, which is crazy when it's string at 70 cents. Yeah. And think about it if you are one of those directors. Let's assume you are professional and objective. So you just approved the NAV of X, and now you want to buy it at X minus. Puts them in a hard spot, absolutely. If it, if particularly if there's a material, if there's a material difference. And to your other point, so typical BDC, I looked today, I think the end of last week was small ones, 80-ish percent of NAV. <coughs> okay, so typical, you call them zombies, I won't describe that term, $200 million market cap. So you're a real investor, you want to buy $5 million of that stock? You're not buying it at 80, you're driving it to 90 like that. Yep. So it's a really interesting situation where it's supposedly liquid, but the price on the screen you really couldn't accumulate very much. So does this take, are we talking quarters or years, or what's the time frame that this plays out over? I think it's years, Kevin Highly the economics. If you're in the GP economics, and you can run flat and live off redemptions, you're still making a ton of money. Now you might lose employees that aren't in the GP that want to do more deals every year, so you probably see a lot more employee churn, but you know, unless you really have some of these real lawsuits, which you know are really less business oriented and more you know, ethical in nature, uh, you know, I think a lot of these people will run in place and then you, then you look at some of the, you know, the potential acquisitions and kind of what the frenzy it's caused and really there hasn't been any real transactions. I mean, in history, I guess, you know, Aries bought an Allied in what, 2006? It was probably the most successful one. And I didn't even study on this, but I don't know, tell me <coughs> if I'm missing some other- There was another strong one, Prospect and Patriot. Okay, Patriot well, prospect. fair point, yeah. Yeah, right. So, Two. Which was very successful. Right, and there probably should be, you know, over 10 in terms of a going concern on the guys that are trading below book that never have a chance to see in, you know, par anytime soon. But if you're there, if I was the CEO, I'd just be yeah. on that treadmill quarterly, annually. Yeah. I'm making okay money trying to keep my portfolio flat. Well, this way it's going to take quarters, years, unless regulatory reform comes in because some, some one of those 40 has done something extremely uh, against the law or has their marks done in a very poor way, which it's, there's a lot of third party fundamental valuations done now, so it's probably less and less as time goes on, but you could have one major BDC with major legality issues with their valuation, which could blow up a lot of situations and hurt everybody. And I think that's, that's the one catalyst that I can see happening in a shorter time period than kind of the whole industry kind of consolidating quickly. I just don't see that happening. Short regulatory regulatory the, only, the only other thing I could uh, think of on the on the positive side to drive the the stock prices up is it does seem like the the interest from from the broader investment um, public in the in the BDCs is pretty heavily tied to interest rates, and so if we do 
get into a period where interest rates are rising, you know, every quarter, and and people feel like there's, um, you know, there's real momentum, and that there's going to be a lot of interest rate increases, then that could cause people to uh, become interested again in the BDC sector and and drive the prices up. Um, one other thing, just to throw out on the other side of the of the coin, I think historically the BDC managers got surprised by being taken out of those broad indexes, and, and that's yeah. really that's that really hurt, that's really yeah. hurt the sector. I mean, that's a hard that's a really hard thing to recover yeah. from. So two two observations. One, imagine one of you wants to acquire acquire a BDC. Well, you know, you, you acquire the management contract. First of all, you can't acquire from the manager. It's an asset of the BDC. Second, if you have it transferred to you, as we did at Oak Hill from NGP, then you're still subject to the 40 Act, which you guys may not live in all day long. I, I have. And it's terminable immediately without penalty. So not a huge incentive. Um, next, to the question of how long, there's a parallel market in Europe, somewhat parallel, where, where Conversus was listed, listed private equity funds. So the firms like PIP, which is Pantheon, you guys probably know Pantheon, a well-respected fund of funds manager here in the U.S., they're actually based in London. They've had a vehicle, PIP, symbols P-I-N. It's outpaced the FTSE hundreds of basis points for decades in terms of its NAV growth. It sort of generated fund of funds type returns, 20% discount to NAV, and it's traded there <coughs> consistently. Partners Group has one called Princess, plays an 8% dividend, might be a buy, 16-17% um, discount to NAV. So I live that market, and we sold Conversus, I won't look too much into that, because we produced good returns but traded at a discount. These other guys, there are many good managers who produce good returns for a long period of time in Western Europe, and, the, and it hasn't changed. It hasn't changed. Was it fair to even look at American Capital? I, mean, I like the firm, I look at friends there. They've been below book for eight, 10 years. Yeah. They've been buying shares from 60 cents to 80 cents for five years. And now, 2016, they finally have an iBanker and they might trade, who knows, but at least it's been announced. Yeah. Look how long that's taken. Right. So, right. You know, almost a decade. No, absolutely. And they're so, bigger, but. So, no, that's. I, that's interesting. So, I, so let's talk about what that means. So I think we, we've heard panel things in terms of what's happening, what long it'll take, and just in terms of what, what that means for the market, um, Gold Sheets uh, re released their quarterly um, outlook uh, a couple weeks ago. And one of the statements here I'm just going to read because I thought it's a good way to frame the, the discussion. Um, so they're talking about the, the challenges in the space and, and the downgrades. There's some recent downgrades by um, Fitch and Moody's. Uh, and the, the, their statement is, as a result, Market participants expect BDC liquidity to remain constrained for the balance of the year, with many being very selective in which deals they can and cannot do. Is that, are you guys seeing that in terms of their activity level? Or do you anticipate that? I, I think it depends on size. Um, and to Jason's point, the diversity of funding sources. I mean, what we see is the, the larger more diverse um, BDCs really haven't been impacted that much by the fact that they're a BDC or or not. It's um, you know we can have a different discussion about um, about credit and where we are in the credit cycle and what kind of decisions lenders are making based on that. But um, but I think you know we see the larger, more diversified BDCs acting pretty much the same. Um, but as you go down the the scale in terms of size, then you start to see, you know, ones that really are more capital constrained, and as a result, um, you know, you don't see them as much uh, in the market certainly as you did in 2014, 2015. So, Kevin, I'd be curious. We, I found, I was surprised. I was in uh, Asia recently doing some fundraising, a roadshow, doing some fundraising meetings. And uh, did not know what the level of awareness would be with sponsor finance, BDCs, lower middle market, and was shocked at how aware people are of the BDCs and of the challenges. Uh, be curious if, if you've seen or heard from, from investors as you're out talking to folks, if they're aware of what's really going on. Yeah, no, they are. Um, I think, you know, when 
you know, we're, we're out fundraising uh, consistently now, so you get that question all the time. Why, why should I invest in a illiquid credit fund versus a, a publicly traded BDC? At a discount, no less. And I, I, I obviously, you know, counter that with the credit quality of the deals that we're doing, what we're putting into our book. You know, I think fundamentally the, the major defense about it, and to Jason's point before about kind of deployment of assets, anytime you are fundamentally forced to put money to work because you've got to pay a quarterly dividend to keep the chain, the chain uh, going, you know, fundamentally I think you either need to stretch into deeper parts of the capital structure to get your yield, which I think we were talking about before. Um, you know, or your credit quality skills and your covenants and the things that you kind of hold true as a, as a credit investor, either go out the window or you kind of look the other way on a lot of things. And so I would say fundamentally the reason why I think the, the BDC index trades where it does is because you have a lot of second lead meds in a vehicle where people I think expect it to be more senior in the capital structure. And I think when you really dig into kind of the underlying credits and the valuations, you've got, you know, poor credit quality, you know, type assets than, than you think you get. So from what I basically trade off of that is, you know, we're more t senior secure top of the capital structure. That's the difference in what we do. There's less liquidity in what we do. There's no question about that. You can't just trade and get out. But I think some of people's points on the panel, you know, liquidity is only the moment you try to get it if you can actually sell it. And uh, I think we've all seen that through credit cycles, through BDCs coming out. I was at American Capital when share price went from $30 to $9 in two weeks because there were activists there. And the world, the world changes quite dramatically when you think about liquidity when that happens. And that, Sometimes it's not in your control. So I never kind of view the liquidity of a BDC versus the illiquidity of a platform like ours to be the, the, the underlying fundamental reason why you invest. I think you're investing in quality of the credits. And I think, again, if you're forced to put money to work, you're going to make bad decisions at some point. And you may ride it out in a good cycle, but when, uh, you know, look at people's track record between 2007 and 2009, how did they do? And I think you'll have a good sense for how they're going to do the next two years. Uh, and I think just on that, some of transparency. I think if you go back six, seven years ago, insurance companies didn't do floating rate loans, endowments didn't do them, pensions didn't do them. And a lot of asset managers, when the CLO market was closed, coming out of the recession, were going beating on doors like everybody up here has to be like, you know, here's my firm, here's what we do, and here's what a senior rate loan is. And everybody's like, well, I only do private equity and high yield. That's my alternative bucket. And, you know, if the 40 of us, the, if the 40 public BDCs have been through, there's probably 40 other firms that didn't make it through. But all of these people now, Asia, Japan, Middle East, domestically, everyone's probably had you know 50 different asset managers go through their offices and tell them how they're different, how they're unique. And so I think our industry has a lot more of an understanding and transparency. And also now the more public, you have some of these sharper you know equity analysts like Bach who looks in your portfolio and says, "Hey, Mr. So and So, you're 22% energy. That's got to be bad news for you." And you know if you go to the LP meetings, right? Any, if I'm the CEO and you're all my LPs. I'm probably gonna come up there and sell you a lot of sunshine, even if things are a little rocky behind the scenes, right? It's just the nature of it. But now, if Kevin was a reporter and he's looking at my stuff and he knows my loans, and he's out there publishing independent research that says, hey, Van Dusen's portfolio has some cracks in it, he might not have told you that in your LP meeting, but oh, by the way, I've looked and you know he's got something in the Permian Basin, he's got some stuff in the oil sands in Canada, and that stuff is toxic. He'd like you to get cents of the dollar. That is the reason why these stock prices are where they are. There's more transparency now. You can't just sort of bamboozle your LP base with flowery stuff about how things are going. They're smarter. You got independent people that are publishing more data. And so I think everyone has a better sense of peeling back that onion into your portfolio. Where are you playing? You know, how much do you have in junior versus senior versus certain sectors? And I think it's reflective in the stock prices of how these guys are trading because people are smarter making independent decisions now about who they want to back. I think that's a good point. The, the disclosure of your portfolio, BDC or non-BDC, when we were at one of the Fortress, they didn't know anything in our portfolio. We would never say anything, any credit, any individual credit conversation was never a, a part of the conversation. Now, they're like, walk me through every credit in your portfolio. You know, it's a very, I don't think they understand half the things I'm saying, but at the same time, they're like, tell me what's in there and sure. make me feel like I, you know what right. you're talking about. And I think that's, uh, I think that's a different part of the world right now. In a good way. I mean, I think the LP should understand how transparency to what you're doing. And it shouldn't hide anything. It's, it's if you're doing what you said you're going to do, it's, it's pretty easy. Yeah, it's great for the investors that have more transparency now who didn't before. Let's round out the talk about BDCs and the trends there. Let's round out the discussion on the supply of credit sort of in the, in the near term. So what are you seeing from other players, uh, the banks, CLOs, hedge funds, private credit funds? What, what are you seeing in terms of you know, their level of activity? Are they active? Are, are there, which elements are 
getting more active and less active. I, I, we've been talking about size. I bifurcated. You have to bifurcate it by size to market. I think you know, at Highbridge we were running you know a seven billion dollar book in our last you know last iteration. You were doing hundred plus million dollar checks. That market is still very active. There was three players doing it five years ago. There's probably twenty five players doing it today. So I think there's a lot more competition in that space, and Bob can probably uh, enjoys that level yeah. of competition <laughs> amongst amongst all of us. But. So I think that's been a pretty active space. Banks I haven't seen to be, you know, really involved in the market in a meaningful way anymore. So I think that's been filled up by the larger funds out there. On the smaller end, kind of where I'm playing right now, it's um, it's gotten better from a competitive dynamic. BDCs are a little bit the guys who are just fundamentally only a BDC, not as not as aggressive as they once were. So you know, I don't know, I don't know how many books you sent out, but if you know you're looking at down to four or five guys who are competing, you get the call back now, where you maybe didn't get the call back six months. So I think it's active credit quality and well credit credit in the first two months of the year. Historically, I always find it slow anyway. So it's been I think a slow Q1. Uh, we found a couple of interesting things, but you know overall it's a lumpy business, and um, I'd say it's kind of where it has been historically. But competition seems uh, a little less out there for, my, for the lower end of the middle market. Anyway. Yeah, well I'll, I'll hit I'll the higher end, and I, I think you know. We've, I don't know if the tone seems negative on BDCs. I think it's very positive that this asset class has taken share from banks that have been regulated, you know, over the past three, four, five years, and really that's kind of been the shift, right? The, the deals the banks can't do, the FinCos, the BDCs, you know, sort of the non-regulated. That's been that's where the loans have gone in general, right? So that's why you see 40 public BDCs. You know, before things got a little rocky out there, they all had enough deal flow to survive and were doing well probably two or three years ago. So I think there's still a fundamental shift in, in the capital base again. You know, if you're an LP, it's a different story. But you know, if you're employing, you're running, in, you're, you're running in, in, in place, so to speak, and you're churning 100 million dollars, but you're putting 100 million dollars to work, that's still fine. You're going to weather the storm. If your portfolio stays clean, you know, you'll, you'll be okay. So, but in the upper middle market, so the BDC is, is good, and they're playing, you know, from the lower middle market deals to the lower <coughs> middle market deals. So. All of our BDC is probably I don't know, 25, 30 percent of our capital, but we've seen a ton of deals in the 50 to 100 million dollar space. Which, you know, a year ago we might have had one. You know, we've closed a couple, and right now if I have a pipeline of 35 deals, I think 20 of them are above 50 million of EBITDA. And it's like I'm talking to you and Jeffries, or you and UBS, or you and Goldman Sachs, which is crazy. But that's kind of who they're talking to now because. Someone's looking at their chops from a deal they just lost money on in the BSL market, and really, it's not just I'm not the seven I banks anymore. It's you know Guggenheim's in the mix, and Aries in the mix, and ourselves, and other bigger fincos that kind of have balance sheets that are relatively healthy, with some I banks. But um, it, it's really changed a lot. So there's a lot less deal flow, Dan. In your question, um, and the competition I feel is is narrower. Um, the firms that are doing you know better, I think, just have. Diversify capital sources to pursue it because you know even the banks right now are, are still hurting from yeah you know, every one of them lost money in the last six months and some of them lost a lot of money you guys saw a lot of them have had massive layoffs announced in the last couple months so there's a ton of great human capital out there as well um, and I see a lot of those will probably try to raise money <laughs> soon who's like hey I've been a high banker for 25 years and no credit why go work for some other big firm again why don't I try to go hook up with somebody else as my anchor and go start my own firm because if it's successful, it's very profitable. Yeah, I okay. think uh, I think there's been some real structural changes in the, the primary players that have been historically, you know, the anchors in the in the broadly syndicated market. Um, you've got the banks which are facing uh, the regulatory issues that that they have, but then you also have the CLOs and the the prime rate mutual funds, which historically have comprised most of the buyer universe for that for that paper, um, and the CLOs are facing their own regulatory issues with um, the risk retention rules going into effect. Um, new CLO formation is is down dramatically, and so if you don't have the arrangers, the arranger banks that are able to do what they used to do and don't have the CLOs um, who were two-thirds of the, the buyers of that paper not able to do what they're able to do, it really does open up opportunities for firms like Jason's or uh, some of the other 
large middle market players to go into that 50 to $100 million EBITDA um, zip code and, and club deals together the way that you know historically middle market deals have, have been done all the time because you guys and others have spent the last three or four years of your lives building up um, ways to increase your hold sizes and so now there's there's definitely enough depth in, in what have historically been middle market players to step into that you know, 500, 600, 700 million dollar credit facility arena and, and get club deals done in that, in that market. Can I digress on CLOs for Please. a second? So, if, I don't know if you're familiar with CLO asset, but they have kind of a weighted average risk factor, it's called a WARF. And as they have downgrades, you know, that number goes down and they have you know, compliance with both Moody's and S&P by what they need to be need to make new deals and I think between energy and some downgrades defaults me up a little bit um, people are concerned about their B3 or triple C bucket so those are kind of the lowest two areas they can have and still you know they have a limitation for both and so right now the, the reason I bring up the story is the B3 buckets are full for almost every asset manager out there like to get a B3 through the market today would be very difficult it would probably price wide and a lot of CLOs you could tell them that you know I have a whole co pick mill for Apple at 5%, and it's a B3, and I can't do it, right? And it's just, you know, it's kind of like illogical, but they're constrained. And so for firms like ours and others, you know, they could, they could be this you know, rougher deal in the market. I try to use my word selectively. That's, it's going to be cyclical, it's lower levered, but it got a B2. And all of a sudden, you know, the book gets oversubscribed, and you got some great software deal that got bought for 15 times, and it got a B3. <laughs> And the market can't buy it. So one deal gaps out to like Labor 600, 650. Kevin and I take $50 million a piece. We call one another and we're like, wow, this is great. And some other deal, it's a B2, that's a cyclical, you know, it's going to have a downturn, clears at 525. And it's all this sort of technical wharf management stuff. And I, and I get it at the same time, you take a step back. Like, it doesn't make any sense if you're just looking at return on, you know, uh, risk adjusted return without any technical limitations on it. So the good news about the BDC asset class, why we only have one times leverage. We don't have a lot of the wharf and a lot of the other stuff and even a lot of the CLO stuff. So we, we, we sometimes we pick our spots. We can do a big ticket on a very attractive trade once in a while based on some of these technical sort of uh, issues that are presented itself in the marketplace today that really don't make a lot of logical sense. And, and no good PM would look at both deals and say they're equal, but they're going to say, gosh, I can only buy this one. I can't buy this one. And for us to have more flexibility, you know, we're all over the other trade. So it just seems to be, you know, screaming by. It's kind of like, well, I've stated the case. I, no, no, absolutely. So, and I think Kevin um, talked about getting calls, callbacks that he wasn't getting before. And I can tell you, we have seen, I have a lot more friends today than I had a year ago. Um, a lot more people want to meet with me, want to see me, want, and that's, you know, um, that's hopefully that's a good sign. And, uh, and more than just, just uh, my charm. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Your time and your time.